question at the back. Hi. Uh, I uh, recently had the pleasure of portraying Simone with uh, Marcel over here, Marcel Serraye, as we walked around the Barnard campus just recently, uh, last Wednesday. Um, I'm a playwright, and I've written about Dorothy Parker already, and so this really kind of got my interest up. And I was wondering if you can recommend some good biographies about her, um, some other of her works that have been translated well that I could read to begin writing about her. If, if you want to know more about her, well, of course, you could read her novels and figure a lot of things out about her. But she wrote a lot of uh, autobiographical work. Her memoirs. Her memoirs, starting with uh, the diaries of a dutiful daughter, are just absolutely extraordinary. Her, I think her memoirs are, oh, the, are, are the best, the mm -hmm. best things. Also, they're yes, all they're all translated. They're all translated. And I think they're translated fairly I, well. I don't know. I, I, I'd be I careful know. of reading biographies, though. <laughs> Bi well, there's about one her. biography by Ursula, Ursula Tidd, Tid. T-I-D-D. It's short, and it's published, I don't remember by whom, I think in, in Great And it's a very good biography. Mm. There's also the biography that has not been translated called Castor de Guerre by Daniel Salenov, but it's 700 pages long. It just came out last year. But it's very, very, it's very good. But Ursula Tidd has really in our opinion, the best biography. But the other thing to read are the letters. She wrote amazing letters. She wrote 300 letters, it seemed, <laughs> to every man she ever had an affair with. I, we don't know if they were the same. They weren't the same 300 letters, were they? We, we, we think so. <laughs> I guess after 300 letters, she broke it off. But um, <laughs> she, she, she has incredible letters with Sartre. Those are amazing. And the amazing. letters to Nelson Algren are, are remarkable, because she writes them in English, by the way. She writes the letters to Nelson the Algren, Nelson. And, and it's pretty good English. And then the other thing is the diary that she wrote when she crossed, when she traveled across the United States called America Day by Day, translated by Carol Kosman, who's a brilliant translator. And that's a very good book. And that's really wonderful. good. Yeah. And she, uh, in her memoir, she has many, 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 many passages about American literature. And they're wonderful, but I, I, I can't remember whom she talks about in, in which volume. In which volume. But um, yeah. uh, they're very, very interesting, very perceptive, very, very personal at the same time. She was extremely literary, in addition to being a philosopher, which she said she never was, but she was uh, really, uh, she writes amazing literary criticism. So it was interesting to hear the pressures that were on partially. I'm curious to know what was the charge that you were given and what was the interaction like um, during your translation? Um, Anne Solange Noble of Ganimar who was the, who is now the foreign rights editor of Ganimar, and who is the one who, in a way, is the, the heroine of the story, because she wanted to have a new translation long before we came onto the scene. She wanted to do it for Ganimar and, and for women. And um, what she wanted, and what was our brief was, to translate it in the same way as the original book. That is, it was a trade book. It was not an annotated version. And as we said, there were, she had very few footnotes, relatively few footnotes. And so what we wanted to do was to keep our own translator's notes to a minimum so as not to um, uh, alter the, the text and, and even the way it looked on the page. Um, and so that was what we w did, and we were extremely um, helped by the editor, our first editor at Jonathan Cape, who was Ella Alfrey, <coughs> who, is, who was headhunted then and is now the deputy editor of Granta, the English literary magazine. She was a wonderful, wonderful editor. 
And she encouraged us and helped us. Everybody, everybody did. And then it went to, then it came out in Great Britain. And uh, then the Knopf editors also were extremely helpful and, and, and uh, we we had no problems with like like uh, partially did uh, we were encouraged every step of the way uh, and we still are. They they were clear about what they wanted, but um, a, a lot of people wanted something else from this um, this translation because it's true it offers very rich possibilities. There's so much in it. That was our job, and that's the job we did. And you should also understand that this book could never be retranslated into English unless Knopf decided, mm -hmm. because the Knopfs actually bought the English rights. So no one else could ever translate it into English. They bought the exclusivity of that's the English right. rights. And it wasn't until they made the decision, which was in two, actually in 2004, 2005, I think, yeah. But they had been dragging their feet for a very long time, and we were standing there in the waiting. wings, <laughs> just waiting for it to happen. In 2001, we thought they were ready to do it. We had met with the publishers, uh, the, the editors, editors. editors at uh, Knopf, and they said, well, I guess you're right, and I guess it's time. But it wasn't until um, Sarah Glazer wrote the article in the New York Times that they were finally kind of pushed to the wall and said, okay, let's, let's do it. Really? Well, the the copy editors, the the British copy editors, changed the spelling. I mean, that's really just a detail, and there were some expressions that they changed. Uh, they don't. They use which when we use that. Uh, there, so they changed grammar things, but there really isn't that much difference. It's uh, very minor. It's re really minor things. It's a lot for a copy editor, but. In the scheme of things, it's not a big deal. And then when it came back to Knopf, they changed it back. Yeah. There's someone right here. I have a whole number of questions, but I'll just ask one. And, <laughs> and if the answer is very short, I'll slip to the other one. Uh, speaking of editors, uh, did Simone de Beauvoir have a lot of interaction with her editor? In other words, what, do you know? <laughs> yes. Um, she. I don't really know exactly, but I think that anything that she gave, almost anything that she turned in was published, except a book that is called, uh, I can't remember what it's called in English, Quand Prime le Spirituel, yeah. which she wrote very early, and uh, it was rejected. rejected. And then it came out again in 1979, and then it came out uh, again, I don't know, a few years ago, maybe Liliane, the... Yes. It was very different in French uh, and the spiritual and uh, in the adopted daughter, uh, Sylvie. Sylvie. The Beauvoir overlooked her. That oh. was the first book. Um, yes. yes. Uh, what I was getting at is whether there was, in the case of the second sex, whether there was, you know, an earlier version, so to speak, because the editors no. got very involved. No, yeah. no. So that was short. May I get to the second? Um, <laughs> uh, and then I'll stop. Um, you talked about emphasizing the philosopher, I mean, and the authentic philosophy that she was writing about. And I didn't hear in your reduced CVs whether that either of you were uh, <laughs> philosophers. The question is, did you feel you had to read some of those philosophers that you quoted? We aren't. We weren't philosophers, but we are now. <laughs> we had such wonderful consultants and people that we knew and people that helped us over the philosophical parts, not to mention a reader, an extraordinary reader who took a very long time and read it in great detail, and she is a master translator of Simone de Beauvoir. Or mistress, mistress translator <laughs> of Simone de Beauvoir. And uh, not to mention Peg Simons herself, who followed it very closely as we went along. And um, you couldn't have, I don't think you could have two people more experienced than Peg and, and Mary Beth Mary Mader, Mary. who uh, followed the whole, everybody knew that that's, that would be our weakness. 
but don't think we didn't read and ask questions, we did. I'm wondering how often are translators also writers? I, I'm, I know that translating must be writing as well, but I just, in terms of the two fields as they're Louise usually can, described. Can yeah. Louise can answer that. Okay. Louise. Maybe I can try to or answer that. Or are either of you writers? No. Not really. Well, it depends how you define a writer. I think they've, right. they've published a number of books mm -hmm. together and, and presumably written them. A lot of translators <laughs> are, also, are also writers. It often goes together, but it's the, I think the, um, the joy of translation is the game that one plays between the two languages, which not many writers play. Some, some do, some self-translate, some are multilingual or write texts that have other languages in them. But while a, a translator is often also a writer, I think that is what makes the difference for a translator, is this, this play between languages. Yeah. Yeah. There's, a, there's a mic just there. No, no, there. it's coming. Samuel Beckett was the one not he wrote his book and translated his books and uh, his one and and um, Albert Camus translated also Dostoevsky so many writers but Samuel Beckett is uh, was really truly bilingual because he wrote his book and didn't trust anybody to translate them <laughs> and <laughs> he, yeah, never cough, but... Uh. A question, a question right here, the young man in the striped shirt? Or not striped, check shirt. Wait a minute, wait a minute, there's a mic coming to you. I've taken a couple Latin and Greek classes and we translate some things. And um, my professors, closer? Sorry. <laughs> my professors have always told me that uh, when you translate, you destroy, and you lose some of the initial meaning, no matter what. Oh, what do you guys think about that? Louise? <laughs> help us, help us. I think, I think that is the worst cliche there is about translation. <laughs> Terrible. This, this lost in translation that you see again and again, most recently in a, in a rather mediocre Hollywood film, um, <laughs> is something that clings to translation. But when you think about it, if you did not translate, you wouldn't read Dostoevsky, you wouldn't read Simone de Beauvoir, you wouldn't have access to German philosophy, you wouldn't have access to hundreds of works from other languages. Translation is a huge gain on the whole. Of course, the translation changes a text, but does it lose something in the process? It's debatable. We can always, we, we'll always have critics on both sides. It's a loss, it's a gain, it's good, it's bad. But basically just the, cha the, the making available of new knowledge in another language is a huge plus. I think that's my answer. I don't know if the... <laughs> <laughs>